Dear ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Room for Discussion. Migration is one of the most divisive issues of contemporary politics. According to Professor Heinde Haas, the debate about migration is one that is filled with myths and misconceptions. With his most recent book, How Migration Really Works, he tries to combat those and offers a nuanced and depoliticized account filled with facts that transcend left and right. If there's one question we won't be asking Professor de Haas today, it's whether he is for or against migration. Instead, we'll be talking to him about why that question misses the point, what the media and politicians have long gotten wrong, and how we can move forward from here. So my name is Nayanthara. And I'm Elizabeth. Please give a warm round of applause to Professor Heinde Haas. Yes, there. Thank you. <laughs> Hi. Welcome to the stage. Thank you. Okay, so Professor De Haas, welcome. Thank it's you. It's nice to have you here on your home territory, if we can say that. Sure. Um, you, your book, How Migration Really Works, was published two weeks before the PVV, a right-wing populist party running on an anti-immigration platform, won the Dutch elections last November. This seems like really great timing in terms of publicity, um, but in all seriousness, did you expect this? The election results? The election results, the fact that it runs so perfectly with the publication of your book. No, it's pure coincidence. You planned for such a book year ahead or months ahead, so mm -hmm. you cannot plan for that. But uh, yeah, of course, it did draw some attention to the book. Uh, more than I expected initially, but I was particularly pleased that the book has been reviewed positively both in more right and left-wing newspapers, and that mm -hmm. was exactly what I aimed to do, because I wanted to make clear in the book that uh, a lot of misconceptions on migration persist across the political divide. It's not just, you know, right-wing parties being wrong or left-wing parties being wrong, but the whole debate is somehow based on the wrong frame, the, the way we talk about it, that's mm -hmm. already wrong. So it's a very fundamental problem. So in that sense, I was quite pleased. I don't believe that a book like this will change the world. And certainly not within two weeks after being published. Uh, but I, the goal is more to have a different debate about migration. So. We are definitely going to talk about the debate and also um, it being in the left and in the right later on. but. First, maybe um, not only the um, elections were pretty much dominated by migration, but also the fall of the Ritte cabinet um, four months before the publication of your book um, happened on an issue of migration. Why is it that migration is the most divisive issue of today's politics? It is very attractive for politicians to use migration. It's a very emotional topic, so you, it resonates easily with voters. And it is also very suitable um, politically for two reasons. On the one hand, migrants, and particularly asylum seekers, are the perfect scapegoat. Mm -hmm. So a lot of people experience uh, discontent with the way how society is going. For instance, particularly young people having difficulties finding accessible housing, uh, student debt being piled up. We also see growing inequality in Western societies where lower income earners haven't gained at all or even have lost out from the wealth creation of the last 50 years in terms of actual purchasing power. In other countries you have problems with access to health care, for instance. So we see a lot of issues that people are not happy about. And of course these are not natural phenomena. This is created by government policy. Mm -hmm. uh, growing inequality has to do with the change of government policy, economic policy, growing job insecurity, we have dismantled labor law, labor protection, same for public housing. Um, we have withdrawn a lot of public money from the sector, we have privatized a lot of social housing. And these were all policy choices, political choices, the liberalization of the economy. So it's very attractive for politicians to say, well, it was not us, it mm. was them. It were the asylum seekers that created all the problems to distract the attention away. And was it always the case, um, or was there a specific point in time where kind of this blaming of migrants 
started? It's happened in different phases that the outsider was blamed. Sometimes it was the outsider from within, not necessarily immigrants. Mm -hmm. Sometimes these were native born people, or if you look at European history, uh, racism towards Jews, but also yes. towards Roma and Sinti people. These were not necessarily migrants. In most cases, they were, not, they were totally native, but they were constructed as the ones who created all these problems. Uh, but also if you go back in history, for instance, you look at US history, it's almost unimaginable, but uh, a century ago, Italians were seen as an impossible to integrate group. Uh, it, was wonder it was questioned whether Italians were white in the first place, mm. heavily discriminated against. Think about how Jews were res received in the United Kingdom a century ago, and you can go on and on and on about yeah. different groups. Here, even in the Netherlands, until the 1960s, Southern European migrants were seen as impossible to integrate. So. We have seen different waves of anti-immigration policy politics throughout history, I would say. It's very convenient. And the other reason why it's attractive, so you have the scapegoat function yeah. of the outsider. The other is you construct an external enemy, which is always attractive for politicians. A well-known recipe for a politician who threatens to lose the next election is to wage a war, because you get a rallying around the flag phenomenon. But if there's no real external enemy, you can also create one. And the foreign invasion, the invention of the invasion of foreigners, these waves of people coming in, threatening to submerge our culture and society, is the perfect uh, tool. tool for that for politicians. Because they can then portray themselves as a savior who's going to fight the fight against illegal migration against asylum seekers. So these are the two functions. It's yeah. a savior function and it's a scapegoat function. Okay, so before we get into the rhetoric, um, can you just sketch out, sketch out the different types of migrants for us? I think the most important distinction is that between, and it's a lot confused, is refugees and labor migrants. Mm -hmm. Of course, we have also people who follow, like family migrants, but the, it's more like a result of those other two migrations. We also have student migration, more important these times. But historically speaking, it is primarily about labor. And most big migrations in the world had to do with labor. So if you look in Europe, the guest workers came to Europe because they were invited to work here in the 1960s because there wasn't enough work, uh, not enough uh, local workers. So we invited them over. We actually went to Turkey, we went to Morocco to actually get the workers that didn't just show up here. And that is also true nowadays. You know, most migrants that come to Western countries come to do jobs. Now, a smaller category is refugees. Roughly 10% of the world migrant population is refugee. Mm -hmm. So all migrants in the world, it's roughly 3% of all people in the world. So refugees is roughly 0.3%, but an important category because politically this is a firebrand issue. Yeah. What do we do with refugees? Who should we accept, etc., etc. But it is a small, relatively small part of the total sort of picture. Okay. And when you're talking about this, about the different types of migrants, how much of overall migration actually happens illegally? Well, it's a good question. We don't know exactly because we don't count um, illegal migration. But we have some reasonable estimates. It seems to suggest that in most European countries, we don't talk about perhaps 10%. But it could differ eh, from country to country. 10% of all migrants uh, have no documents. In the United States, it's probably higher, between 20 and 25% of all migrants. Uh, although it's important to know that most undocumented migrants came in legally. And then overstay their... Overstay their visas, which mean, means that even a perfect wall will not be able to stop that phenomenon. And then just to clarify, the other way to count illegal migration would be to see how many people are apprehended at the borders, correct? Yeah, that's one strategy. Another one is statistical methods, the population register. A lot of censuses actually do register undocumented migrants. You can sort of um, compare all these data and get some idea. I estimated myself, for instance, that on, based on existing data, that of all the... So when you talk about African migration to Europe, you get this impression of boats, right, across the Mediterranean. Roughly nine out of ten Africans coming to Europe comes legally, not illegally. It's only one-tenth that belongs to that category that either comes by boats or hidden in trucks or vans 
or overstaying their visas. So it's an important, 10% is a lot, but it's still much smaller than you would think if you watch television, but you think, oh, they all come through these boats. So it's important to put that in perspective. Yeah, so you all already kind of started to um, paint the picture. Um, we can like just um, finish it now. So the media, um, when we're looking at the media and what politicians tell us, it's easy to get the impression that we are living in an era of unprecedented mass migration. Yeah. Is that actually true? Well, if you look absolutely, yes. There are many more migrants than there were 50 years ago, but the world population has increased by the same rate, which means if you express the level of international migration, as I mentioned before, uh, roughly 3% of the world population lives in another country than they were born, so that's the definition of a migrant. Although I should say, from a European perspective, a lot has changed, because Europe, of course, used to be the continent of colonizers, missionaries, soldiers, col uh, migrants, so the Europeans always moved to other continents, particularly the Americas, but later also Africa, mm. Asia. And that pattern has completed, so after four centuries, or over four centuries, of Europeans colonizing other nations and being migrants going to other nations, those patterns have fundamentally re re reversed. I call this the global migration reversal. And it had to do with decolonization, so Europeans could no longer just go anywhere. It had to do with uh, unprecedented wealth in Europe. It had to do with... Uh, declining birth rates, mm. it had to do with increasing levels of education, which meant that there were less and less European workers available for the lower skilled jobs. And this is how migration came in. With decolonization, with labor demand, Europe has become transformed, Western Europe, from the main continent of out-migration to a very important destination. So for European countries, that's a game changer. But it doesn't mean it's all about illegal migrants coming in from, it's mainly about legal migration of workers and to some extent refugees coming to Europe, meaning that now in Europe roughly 15% of the population of most European countries is an immigrant. And a fair share of that, differ differing from country to country, uh, is, is non-European. And that's a new thing, of course, from a European perspective. So it's not surprising that triggers some debate. Mm. Your book is organized in 22 myths. So every chapter is a different myth, and I guess this is one of the biggest ones, um, one of the most surprising ones for a lot of people. Um, and you have a number of other ones that we'll get into, but something that stuck out, stood out to me when I was first reading this is a lot of the numbers that you bust, a lot of the myths that you bust in this book are numbers provided by NGOs and international organizations as well. And my first assumption would be that these are the reliable, genuine actors that we should be listening to when we're trying to research this. So what is in it to, for these organizations to contribute to this ecosystem of migration myths? That's a good question. I mean, I can never know for sure, but I definitely think there is an interest for organizations to increase or exaggerate the increase of refugee numbers or of migrant numbers. For instance, the United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees does all sorts of wonderful work. I want to emphasize how important it is. But in a way, as part of the mandate, there's also a certain interest to draw attention. Mm -hmm. yeah. And it helps every year if you can report there has never been that many refugees in the world. Figures are skyrocketing because you draw the headlines. And I think it has also to do with the idea when we get attention, we get support and funding, of course, because those organizations are systematically cash-strapped because member states don't give enough contributions to those organizations. So my best guess, it's funding needs, attention needs, but it's a perverse dynamic. For instance, with refugee numbers, yes, refugee numbers have gone up over recent years, but if you look at the longer term, it's more of a up-and-down movement without a clear trend up or downward. But if you look at the official statistic, like the official graphs on the website, it seems that it's totally skyrocketing over the last 10 to 15 mm. years. But it is mainly because they in included a category of refugees that didn't include before. And this is people who are displaced within countries. Whereas if you go on the left of the graph, it were only international refugees. And how much 
um, does urbanization play a part in that, in internal migration? How, how much has that gone up over the years? Well, this was about internal displacees, eh? so basically yeah. internally displaced persons. So they have always been internally displaced persons, but they weren't added to the previous statistics. And in previous statistics, less countries were included, so you're basically comparing, comparing uh, apples and oranges. And uh, were they, like, those organizations then also aren't transparent about this, are they? Well, their own, we, we have written a few articles on this. Their own data, if you really look, look well at it, actually you could discover that they compile numbers that you shouldn't be compiling. Exactly. So I hope that those organizations will use their own data better so that they're not presented in a misleading way. So I think it would add to the credibility. And another reason why I think that is smart to do if you keep on pumping headlines like, oh, there's never been as many and it's skyrocketing, you may actually undercut public support for, for instance, helping refugees. Because if people get the impression it's just too many, it's getting out of hand, you may actually undercut. So those organizations may, in a way, shoot themselves in the feet mm. if they keep on doing that. So I'm really hoping they will reform and rethink that strategy as ultimately not serving their own purposes. So some of the really um, common talking points that we hear a lot in the migration debate is that migrants are coming to steal our jobs or that they are living off of taxpayers' money and taking advantage of our welfare systems. You already kind of talked about how labor demand, um, how mi labor migrants fill important demand, but can we get a sense of how much of migration is um, people fleeing poverty, and how much of it is driven by being wanted migrants with, to fill labor shortages? I mean, clearly, labor demand is the main engine of international migration. If, if people couldn't, to, to, to start with that first talking point about migrants taking away jobs, we actually have to reverse the causality. Migrants generally fill vacancies. They don't take jobs. So. Mm -hmm. Migration is generally very high when economies are doing well, when unemployment is low. Lots of vacancies, you attract a lot of migrants. If economies are not doing well and employment is going up, not many migrants come and quite some migrants will go back. But from that perspective, the, the best way to really bring down migration is to wreck the economy. Mm -hmm. So you in a way have to turn around the whole logic. Now, poverty is an interesting topic because many people do think, particularly when you talk about migration from the global south to the global north, that poverty is a big driver. Now, of course, poverty could motivate people to migrate, for sure, but the poorest of the poorest people don't migrate much. The lowest migration rates in the world are found in sub-Saharan Africa. And if you look at what countries are the most important immigration countries in the world, you'd easily think about countries like Turkey or Mexico or the Philippines or Morocco. These are middle-income countries or India. These are not the poorest countries in the world. Mm. Why? Because migration requires a lot of resources, particularly migration internationally to Western destinations. You need to be not super poor in order to afford that. So generally it's more the lower income group, lower middle income groups that migrate a lot over long distances. The second factor is education. From a lot of research we know that education increases people's aspirations, it increases their perceived material needs, but it also leads to mentality change, where people simply no longer want to stay on the farm. They mm. want to move to the city, and some of them will move abroad. So what we see in research is that immigration and migration uh, increases as poor countries get richer, and that is the paradox. So people may, of course, be motivated to migrate if they're really poor, but they cannot afford it. So, some level of development is a prerequisite for emigration. So, the political narrative, which you often hear on the left-wing side, that, for instance, we need to stimulate development in poor countries so people yeah. will not come, the evidence rather suggests that development in really poor countries will lead to more migration. Of course, those countries that have very high migration now, any further development will lead to less migration, and they will become an immigration country. And that is what happened in the recent past to, Mac uh, to uh, Turkey, for instance, has really transformed from an emigration to an immigration country. But if you're really poor, any form of development, better education, higher incomes, poverty reduction, infrastructure, will only facilitate migration. So those are the economic drivers of migration. Um, 
what about the consequences? How do, how do immigrants, how does a rise in immigration affect host countries? That's a complex question. <laughs> First of all, shall we start with the integration question? Maybe, maybe you're maybe still connected to the topic of economy. Okay. So a lot of economists have done research on the income effects of immigration. Mm -hmm. And actually what they found is it has barely any effect in the first place. Some found slightly positive effect. So for instance, what is the effect of migration of average incomes of people who already were in the country? It barely changes. Also in employment, it has a very marginal impact, sometimes positive, sometimes negative, but the main message is it's a very small impact. Why? Migration isn't as massive as we think. And secondly, this is what economists call the lump of labor fallacy, people think when migrants come, unemployment has to go up because there's a set number of jobs, right? Yeah. But what happens is that migrants make the whole economy better, uh, bigger. So migrants also spend money. And it means the whole economy, the whole pie gets bigger, but almost everybody gets an equal share. The catch is in the following. So on the average, if, on the average you can neither tell a story about migration is fantastic or migration is bringing down the economy. If you look at the dis income distribution, you clearly find that although on the average the effect is almost marginal, that higher income earners benefit much more from immigration than lower income earners. And in a way it's logical because they either possess the businesses that become more profitable because of influx of migrant labor, but also the people who use the services of migrants. So think about private households, hiring nannies or cleaners or ordering food that of course we know who's working in the delivery sector, it's lots of migrants. So they benefit from the relatively cheap labor that migrants bring in. And people on the bottom end of the labor market, let's say the lowest 10% income earners, don't benefit economically from migration at all. So and, these, and these are typically the people also living in those neighborhoods where you see the day-to-day -day consequences of immigration. So, said differently, the social and economic costs and benefits of migration are generally not equally distributed across the population. Mm. And that is politically relevant, of course, to understand why some segments of the population may be more or less enthusiastic about immigration. You've said in the past that you can't have your cake and eat it too, yes. about politicians, um, how they deal with the economic need for migrants in a way. Is yeah. this... Is this um, is this how you would frame what you just said? I think this is a central political dilemma that most politicians don't want to face. And also explains why so much of the emphasis on, is on asylum and not on the biggest chunk of immigration, which is about the economy. Mm -hmm. You cannot have two things at the same time. On the one hand, you want to have this open, well, wealthy economy with this flexible labor market that creates all these kind of jobs that migrants typically fill, and you want to have less immigration. So I already said there's this very close association between the business cycle and migration. So you cannot have both at the same time. So we have deregulated the labor market, we've made it so easy to start an employment agency, to hire people on temporary contracts to create all sorts of unattractive jobs that typically native workers don't want to do. The result is high immigration. So we have had two meta trends in the West, in the political economy. The one has been since the 1980s, a drive towards liberalization of the economy and the labor market. And on the other hand, the political call for less immigration. Mm -hmm. And both don't go together. And it is the basic reason why three to four decades of politicians promising voters, I will bring down immigration, has not succeeded. Because they need it. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. Um, one of the ways in which this issue more specifically plays out in the Netherlands is also the anti-internationalization anti debate in um, higher education. Um, and especially here it often happens that international students are uh, painted as like part of the, for, partly responsible, for example, for the housing crisis. You also mentioned that earlier in, in the interview. So would you say this is true or also international students are just painted as scapegoats? Of course it's true that immigration adds additional pressure to the housing market, but to make the following analysis that the lack of affordable housing, which is a real housing crisis, 
is primarily the result of immigration is simply a myth. The main reasons why in a country like the Netherlands, but in a lot of other countries in the West, we have a lack of affordable housing is a deregularization of the housing market. Mm -hmm. So in many countries, the UK is a great example, but also the Netherlands, a lot of the social housing stock has been privatized. We have dismantled rental protection, and so on and so forth, which means that simply the amount of affordable houses has decreased. Rents have gone up. And of course, my immigration adds some additional pressure or demand to the housing market. You cannot deny that. But it is very attractive for politicians who've pursued all those all those policies that have made housing more affordable housing less less more scarce mm -hmm. and dismantled rental protection to say it's the immigrant that has caused the lack of affordable housing. Yeah, it adds extra pressure. And exactly in that time it's easier to say, well, it's primarily because of the migrants. You can only fix the housing crisis by a radical change in your housing policy. Mm -hmm. And especially, and of course, then it's a point of debate um, whether you're in the position of whether more or less regulation um, is helping the housing crisis, but that's not our issue. No, it, it is in part tied to the argument because what I find so interesting is some of the politicians that have the most tough rhetorics about immigration are often also the politicians that have pursued all those what we often call neoliberal policies. Mm. So there seems to be an interest there to then paint the migrant, particularly the asylum seeker in some European countries, as the ultimate cause. Now, I'm not one to say that immigration never leads to problems or annoyance or can, of course, at local level cre create extra pressures on local housing markets without any doubt. But it's a logical fallacy to reason from there that immigration has been the fundamental cause of that much broader problem. The same for job insecurity and all sorts of other issues. Yeah. So now that we've already been talking about an issue that is the housing crisis that is probably very close to many of us, maybe we could open up the floor for some audience questions. Maybe let's start over here and then up here in the front. Yeah. Wait, wait for the microphone, maybe. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. I'd like to know uh, what part of the refugees are fleeing wars and, and internal conflicts and what myths are described in your book uh, linked to this? Well, we know from quite some long-term data that, for instance, in Europe, roughly half of asylum applicants get refugee status, which means that the procedures actually work pretty well, in a sense. We have a refugee status determination procedures exactly to know who has the right to refugee status and who not. Of course, the system wouldn't work if there was not some verification whether people have valid claims for refugee status. And we don't really see those numbers budging that much. It may differ from year to year. Right now in the Netherlands, they're very high because the Netherlands is clearing a backlog of Syrian asylum applicants, the majority of whom has a clear case for refugee status. But the longer term, it's like 45, 50% actually in Europe. I don't know whether that answers your question. Because there is this impression that refugee migration is increasing. It has increased over the last few years, but it typically goes in this wave-like pattern with peaks and valleys and peaks and valleys. And if you look at the longer term, there is no increase in refugee migration internationally, but also not to the Netherlands. It's actually, on the longer term, a fairly stable pattern. It's of the refugees will uh, seek refuge in their own area, yeah. region. Yeah, that's a very good question, not a misunderstanding, that uh, you often hear politicians talking about regional solutions. And I'm fully in favor of that. And most refugees, actually, also like to stay close to where they come from. Most Syrian refugees live in Turkey, Lebanon, uh, Jordan, not because everybody... It's, this is a sort of misconception that refugees all want to come to Europe. We know from some quite good survey and interview research done on Syrian refugees that most would like to stay close to home mm -hmm. in countries that are more similar in culture, religion, but also they could more easily, you know, keep in touch in a way with the situation back home. 
roughly 80 to 85 percent of refugees stays in the origin region, and that percentage has barely budged over the last decades. So Ukraine is a clear case of regional solutions because they indeed went to neighboring countries, Poland, for instance. And, and this is what you typically see. If a conflict happens in your relative vicinity, you get lots of refugees. And Syria is not that far away in that sense either. Mm -hmm. If some conflict breaks out in farther away countries, we don't see numbers moving that much. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Maybe uh, the other audience question that was in the front. Thanks. Um, about a week ago, you were invited to well, the negotiation table for the new um, cabinet here in the Netherlands, uh, well, especially for your insights on the topic of migration. Um, well, and now these four parties already have difficulty to find common ground, but well, the day that you were there, this quite blew up since Geert Wilders left the same day, well, um, because of a disagreement on this topic. Uh, I'm just curious, what happened in this conversation, and maybe um, are your insights <laughs> too confrontational to just fit into the political narrative um, that's going on in the current day? Very topical question. Well, Geert Wilders walked away not when I was there, just half an hour later or so. So I don't know what happened in between the moment I was done with my contribution. What I try to do to my best consciousness is just to answer questions and to give an overview of long-term trends of migration to the Netherlands. And of course, distinguishing between labor and asylum. And um, the interesting thing is that the press reported, oh, all parties agree on at least on one thing, that's migration. And I, I, don't, I have never believed that in the first place because all parties had this rhetoric about we want less immigration, we want more control on immigration. Although actually it's mainly about asylum. A big party that has always defended the interests of entrepreneurs, the favor day, has always been in favor of immigration. So right, that's another myth that right-wing parties are anti-immigration. But perhaps in rhetorics they are, but in practice they want to keep the door open for labor migrants because the influx of affordable labor is good for business. So in a way it keeps borders open. And we have not found in research any difference between right and left wing in terms of their actual migration policy. Now the PVV party, it's all about asylum. They want to stop asylum seekers. The BBB party is the farmers party. The farmers need migrants. In the NSA party, it's much more critical about labor migration. So the parties don't agree at all as much as you would think. This very simple headline, we want less immigration, is mainly about rhetorics, whereas the different parties talk about completely different things. The real issue is the following, that according to a number of those parties, we need to drastically cut back asylum. Although asylum is 10% of inflows, perhaps 20% of net migration or 25% of net migration, and the real increase is because of labor shortages in the Netherlands. So it's really about asylum. Well, if you really want to bring back labor migration, you have to re-regulate your labor market. You have to decrease the freedom of employers to hire people on a temporary basis. You have, in a way, to dismantle the platform and the gig economy and all of that kind of things, which would go straight against anything where the main parties stand for, which is political liberalization, at least three of the four parties. If you want to bring back asylum, whether that's desirable or not is a very different question, you would have really do some drastic interventions in your international treaties, because we cannot just say we're not accepting any asylum seekers. It would mean you have to change the European Treaty on Human Rights, the International Refugee Convention. That's not something you can change overnight. So when you start to deny refugees, asylum seekers, essential rights, you will be overruled by the courts. So that's a long-term story, even if it's feasible to renegotiate renego renego all these kind of treaties. But that was, of course, not an easy message to swallow for parties that have promised to bring asylum back to zero, if possible, which to me is illusion politics. Yeah, um, you've also analyzed, I think one of your uh, studies analyzed 6,500 policy changes across both the left and the right, and you found, like you just said, that there was practically no difference in the actual policies pursued between the re left and the right. What do you think, kind of, how, how do you understand this gap between um, rhetoric and action? Yeah, so it's very interesting. So many people nowadays think the left is pro and the right mm -hmm. is anti. That's what the, how it's being framed. To the point that even many left-wing politicians believe it themselves. 
Um, but if you look at the history of immigration, it's been primarily employers who've been driven recruitment of migrant workers. For instance, the guest workers in Turkey, from Turkey, Morocco, other countries in, in, in Western Europe were recruited by the, the big businesses and supported also by right-wing parties. So in the 1960s, 70s, were primarily the trade unions and left-wing parties that were actually against immigration because they saw it as a threat for the native worker. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, one way to break the unity of the trade unions. What you actually see is that both the right and the left is internally split on the migration issue. From a political science perspective, really interesting. So the right is in a way split between what I call the cultural conservatives, who construct immigration as this sort of threat or at least challenge for the mainstream identity and religion of the destination country, but on the other hand, a very strong business lobby that just wants to keep mm. borders open mm -hmm. and has an interest in open borders in a way, also for trade, and we don't want to put a fence around Europe because it would be massively harmful to trade. We don't want to abolish Schengen because it is so economically beneficial to have that free circulation area. It's not just about migration, it's about economic interests. The left is also split between the old trade union wing, like for instance in the Netherlands, the Socialist Party, has also declared to be against labor immigration, and what I call the cultural progressives, who tend to construct migration as this wonderful source of diversity, uh, which, which is welcomed, which is kind of celebrated. So we see that within the left and within the right, you see an internal split. And this also his, explains historically why the mainstream parties never took a strong position on immigration, because they knew their own constituencies were divided. And this is the vote that the extreme right wing has successfully now monopolized. So voters, both from the left and the right, have gone to those extreme right wing parties that have a very clear position on that issue. And for those internal splits you have been talking about, both in left and right political yeah. parties, um, have they been like successful in holding those in, like in, like at least externally, like trying to keep the party somewhat together? Or and how do you see that working out in the future? The left seems paralyzed in immigration; mm -hmm. they don't know what to say anymore. The right seems to use. Asylum seekers is one way to distract the attention away from the real debate, which is about labor, I think. Yeah. Because the yeah. increase, because asylum is a, a sizable part of immigration, but in terms of, if you really want to understand the increase in immigration over the last two decades or so to Europe, to Western countries, it's primarily about labor shortages. Yeah. And in a way, I was talking about this, you know, you can't have your cake and eat it too. You can't have that open, liberalized economy. And so in a way, we created an economy that is more and more dependent on migrant labor. The only way to change that is yeah. to deliberalize your economy. It won't take away the need for immigrants altogether, but at least it could have some dampening effect yeah. on immigration. Yeah. And that, from my perspective, is not something, let's say, the right-wing parties really want. So it is easier to distract your attention away to the asylum seeker in order to not to have that debate. Mm, interesting. I'm just wondering, um, because I think that these coalition talks are so interesting and current at the moment, how receptive were, did you feel politicians were to your contribution at that table? I cannot know. <laughs> um, my fear is that they'll be very, very selectively uh, receptive to those messages. Um, to be really honest, I had a moment of doubt whether I would go. Mm -hmm. because I don't want to participate in the normalization of the extreme right wing, and I think that is a dangerous process. So I made a sort of trade-off in my own mind. I think, yeah, but I should still go, because this is a chance to talk truth to power. Although, as I say in my book, I'm a bit skeptical about it, but still, let's give it a chance. And I tried to be as neutral as possible in giving information, answering questions. I got very pointed, detailed questions which gave me some hope, but still knowing the nature of some of the parties uh, in that negotiation that clearly have been spreading myths and lies about mm. migration for so long, I'm yeah. not too confident. It's going to be really interesting to observe how, how it this goes on. Yeah. Well, um, I'm, I'm worried about how politicians have gotten away for so long mm. with all sorts of fear-mongering about migration. And that, that include, includes the left wing, it's not just the right wing. Yeah. So moving on to um, another issue, um, one that has been 
a way that at least politicians say is, is, is a way to reduce migration, which is border policies. Um, and there has been a lot of controversy lately about the so-called, um, lately meant for many years, about the so-called pushbacks. So um, right. the illegal rejection of, of refugees at the external borders of the EU and especially um, also the role of the EU's agency, agency Frontex in yeah. them. Um, so I think like on a human level, it is kind of important to um, realize how abhorrent those are, um, but also on a kind of more practical level, what would you say are the consequences of like putting a wall to those migration and uh, those flows of of migration of refugees and other migrants? I guess. Yeah. Well, again, there's a science of migration, as I say, and and it is, seems very intuitive. If you put in a wall. So less people will come. You make it more difficult to cross, right? It seems to make a lot of sense. But it's not a very scientific way of looking at it. If you want to know the effect of a border or a wall or any migration restriction, you'd first have to realize that migration is not just a process of coming, it's also a process of going. Mm -hmm. So if you want to know what is the result of any border, you have to ask yourself the question, what is the effect of that particular migration restriction on the overall process of coming and going? Now, what we know from research, that ill-conceived migration restrictions can paradoxically lead to more migration, mm -hmm. because they decrease the return movement more than the in-movement. So, what politicians are always interested in is net migration. So, for instance, if you look at African migration to Europe, we see that numbers of Africans coming to Europe, primarily from North Africa, some from West Africa, primarily for work, some for asylum, has gone up. But return movements have stayed flat. The difference between people coming in and returning has increased, so you end up with more people staying. To put it in normal terms, border restrictions often push temporary migrants into permanent settlement. Yeah. And to give you one example, I've done a lot of research in Morocco. Spain introduced visas for Moroccans in 1991 that was part of Schengen. And that's when the smuggling started, because there was no smuggling between Spain and Morocco the main bridge between Africa and Europe between, uh, before 1991. It was completely normal for young North Africans to just move to Italy or Spain and just work for a few months or years, have their gap years, so, so to say, mm. and go back, because why would you stay? Because life back home is cheaper and more pleasant and you have your family and friends. That pattern was interrupted when the border was put in place. Exactly the same happened across the Atlantic between Mexico and the US. Mexicans used to just go back and forth. This is what we call circular mobility. This mm. is what typically happens within a country. Trump didn't build a wall. That's not a part of political propaganda. That started a long time ago already, uh, since Ronald Reagan and his uh, successors. Mexicans stopped moving back and forth. They settled permanently in Mexico and then brought their family members over and facilitated illegal migration as well by helping family members sending money and come across the border because the cause of migration wasn't cut away. The best example is Brexit. Yeah. Yeah. Brexit was meant to stop migration right from Eastern Europe because you couldn't stop it because it's free migration. So the whole idea was that the only way to stop migration to Britain was to get out of the European Union, which was a logically consistent reasoning. You say, well, the only way to stop free mobility from the European Union is to get ourselves out of the European Union. Net migration to the UK before Brexit hovered around 200,000 a year. Last year it was 745,000. Why? Because Brexit didn't, did end the free circulation of workers from Eastern Europe. It didn't end labor demand. Yeah, so I think this this debate about about um, worker circulation is definitely one that is relevant and that is also often forgotten, but, but especially um, when we are talking about pushbacks, for example, at the EU um, external borders. I think that there is might be um, a smaller percentage than we believe it is, but there is still a lot of refugees. Um, that are the subject of those. And, Definitely. and yeah. I think that um, what you described, you know, is true for the, for the work migrants, um, but the experience of those um, refugees definitely is, 
a very different one, one, one that is not imaginable for us, and I think this shouldn't be forgotten in the well, debate that, too. That's an interesting point because uh, another myth is that, in my book, is that smuggling is the cause of illegal migration. Because you hear politicians promising us every year again, when every time again when a boat sinks, or people die in the desert, you can hear these politicians pledging, we're going to fight the fight, the war against illegal migrants, mm. and we're going to dismantle the business model of smugglers, a very common phrase in Europe. And it sounds very solemn, it sounds very praiseworthy that politicians promise these things. What they don't say is that their own policies are part of the problem. Actually, their own policies have created the problem in the first place. Because as long as people have reasons to flee war and oppression, as long as we tolerate that people are being employed illegally on the European labor markets, because we do, we turn our heads, we turn a blind eye, people will find ways to cross borders. So what typically happens if you then increase border patrols, you make migrants dependents of smugglers. Mm. It's not like smuggling created illegal migration, no. The, the smuggling is a service delivery. If I'm a young Moroccan man or woman, or if I'm a refugee from Eritrea and I want to cross that border, I'm going to pay the smuggler to make sure I have a safe passage to the other side of the border. So the border control created the smuggling industry. And we can have border controls for whatever reasons. You can be in favor or against. Apart from that question, is it ethically yeah. justifiable? That is a People don't ask the other question. Is it effective? Yeah. No, it is ultimately self-defeating because you're actually feeding the business model of smugglers. I'm not saying smugglers are good or bad. Most of them drive a business and they want their business to survive and they depend on a good reputation. These are not big international mafias. These are local operators. It's an illegal business, so there's no oversight, so things do go wrong. But just the very idea that even more border controls is going to stop smuggling. No, it's going to feed the business model of smuggling. Yeah. So in that sense, the policy is completely caught up in its own logic. And, and in that sense, there is no end to it. I think um, there's so much more we could say about this. The, EU, the European Parliament is right now voting on a plan um, to completely uh, double down on smuggling, but also to stop irregular departures. And I think we could have another hour long interview <laughs> about that by itself. Um, just looking at the time, I wanna go into integration because I don't think you can talk about migration without talking about integration. And at the center of that debate is this assimilation versus integration debate. You have a really interesting, um, I guess, point in the book about where multiculturalism, where the political interests for multiculturalism come from, and what the integration, what integration policy actually does, how effective it actually is. Can you, um, can you tell us more about that? Yeah, so there has been a lot of talk in Europe about the failure of multiculturalism. It came up in the roughly 15, 20 years ago, and there's this broad assumption now that Multicultural policies are the cause of failed integration, to of problematic integration, let's put yeah. it that way. It's interesting to define what multiculturalism was originally, actually. Um, originally, and this really goes back to the guest worker experience. Uh, so Turks, Moroccans, Tunisians, Algerians, Senegalese, Malinese being mm -hmm. recruited for the French, Belgian, Dutch, German and Scandinavian industries. Something went wrong there, clearly. But the idea is it's because failed integration policies. In a way, there was a policy in place that discouraged the integration. It was the guest worker ideolo ideology. So what happened in the 1970s is that the recruiters, the, the workers that were recruited to work in the industries and mines and other industries of Europe were confronted with mass unemployment because of after the oil crisis, a lot of these businesses went bust or they were relocated to low wage countries, which meant that many people working in industries and mines lost their jobs. Mm -hmm. Native workers, but particularly migrant workers on the principle of last in, first out. But then governments still hold on to this idea that migrants would one day go back to their mm -hmm. original country didn't really embrace the already existing fact that most of them had kind of settled. 
And they hold on to the idea that one day they will go back. And what many people don't realize is that policies that we nowadays see as multicultural, like giving language and religion instruction uh, of the countries of origin to kids of those former guest workers, were meant to prepare the guest workers and the children for the eventual return to the origin yeah. country. It is basically a form, I call it apartheid light, to sort yeah. of put those groups apart, the inability of destination societies to accept the de facto permanency of that immigration throughout the 1980s and even 1990s, led of course to situations of isolation, long-term unemployment and social problems amongst part of the second generation. And when I emphasize that the large majority of them has actually done very well, mm. but in particular neighborhoods that became poverty traps, problems did accumulate. But in a way it was a result of the clinging on to the guest worker illusion, the non-acceptance, particularly in Europe, of having become a de facto immigration country, which yeah. really led, led to serious problems amongst part of the second generation. Yes, so something that goes very much against the praise that is in, in like popular debate about multiculturalism. I want to ask you, um, you touched upon it a little bit already, when saying that, that migration is... Uh, integration, sorry, is more or less an automatic process. Is there any policies, though, that you think governments should actually do in order to um, facilitate integration? Yes, um, giving people pathways to permanency and giving them pathways to citizenships are by far the most successful integration policies. So the idea that governments need to micromanage this, uh, I think it is a quite a silly idea because once migrants have equal rights, they know they have a future, they will invest in their own future in the country of destination. So the longer you deny rights to migrants, the more difficult it becomes. And I think that is very relevant to the contemporary debate about amongst asylum seekers, refugees, new groups of labor migrants with insecure or often illegal status, undocumented status. If you leave certain groups for too long in insecurity, you'll create problems for the future. So I'm afraid we're setting up a new generation of a sort of migrant underclass that are doing all sorts of informal jobs across Western mm. Europe and the United States, whose presence we know is there, but we kind of don't want to see it. So we should focus more on bread and butter issues, on employment opportunities rather than... Yeah, the big obstacle, a lot of research has shown that there's tremendous progress if you look at education amongst the second generation. The prime problem is access to work mm -hmm. and the discrimination of the labor market. Just to get an internship can create massive frustration and sometimes anti... sort of almost reaction against. Uh, the, the majority of society, if people feel excluded. So access to work, and if you give people access to jobs, integration will happen, we know that. Job, getting a job is the best way to integrate anyway. So the idea, and I think one of the problems we have in many Western European countries, is extremely long backlogs in processing immigration and asylum cases, which means that people are left in insecurity for such a long time. So mm -hmm. to talk about refugees, there's high unemployment amongst many refugee groups in Northwestern Europe. That's a huge problem. It's primarily caused by the very long insecurity people face. So one of the problems with creating these huge backlogs is that people don't get security soon enough. It prolongs their trauma, the psychosocial yeah. suffering. It is not good for the economy, and people live indeed of welfare. So it's in nobody's interest. So if you want to have an effective asylum system, you better create policies where you reach good decisions in a relatively short time. Because it's easy to send people back if they've only been in the country for six or nine or 12 months than if somebody's already there with a family and kids who already speak Dutch or German after four yeah. or five years. And then you force people into passivity. So this is what we've been doing in many cases. It's not good for anybody. And certainly not for those who do deserve refugee status. Let people work. Mm. And it's particularly, but it's also for lower skilled labor markets, particularly those without papers, that whose presence we tolerate. In many sectors like cleaning, nannying, delivery, taxiing, we know there's lots of undocumented migrants. And we just turn our heads to that reality. And in that situation, we risk creating a new underclass yeah. of servants, basically. Mm. And I think that's not something that is socially desirable. So we may be setting up the next guest worker illusion.
if we just think that all these people will one day go away. And I think that is the real damage of the illusion politics. Politicians who promise us, and this is not new, this has been going on for three to four decades, politicians who promise us to cut back immigration, but at the same time don't take any responsibility for those people who they allowed in. Making a vicious cycle, yeah. 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 So um, we have now talked a lot about migration and the issues um, as such. I would want to take some time to talk about your project, kind of the one that you pursue with your book and also with uh, those kinds of talks. You try to offer a very um, depoliticized and, and kind of sober account on migration. Um, and I understand that you want to kind of cool down the, the very heated debate and give it a foundation of evidence. Um, however, we are talking about people, right, with, with w wishes and, and dreams. Do you think you're reducing the issue to one of numbers and therefore maybe also losing um, some things within this process? I think it is important to start with the facts. And of course, you cannot construe a policy on facts as a complete illusion. But I think the heat is so high that we desperately need to cool the debate mm -hmm. in the first place. Mm -hmm. Because the level of toxic, tox, toxic, toxicity has re reached dangerous levels, I think. That is why I thought it was urgent to, to say, hey, wait a minute. Uh, we need to cool down first. And that's what the facts show. You cannot base a migration policy just on economic interest, because what is an economic interest? I think we have to re-embed the economy and how we understand society. The economy is part of society. We shouldn't separate this. And this is exactly what we talked about. It is if we only treat migrants as workers, we set ourselves up for trouble. There's this famous quote from the Swiss writer Max Frisch, who wrote mm. about Italian guest workers in Switzerland, who said, we wanted workers, we got people instead. And yeah. that is exactly the error we make time and again, and time and again, and time and again. It's very convenient. You know who's cleaning this university? If you ever come in this building at 7 o'clock in the morning, it's migrants. Who's delivering your food? Migrants. Who's slaughtering the animals? It's migrants. Who's picking the vegetables? It's migrants. And I can go on and go on and go on and go on. So all sorts of essential work has been done by migrants. Yes, it's linked to work, but if we don't think of people as workers as people, we make the same error again, because we know these are people. And we know that there's nothing more permanent than temporary migration. So if you allow people in, or you tolerate that people who don't have papers do all sorts of work, you set yourself up for trouble if you keep on denying it to reach some particular political goal, instead of taking responsibility, make sure those people find a way in societies. That's also a way to prevent social problems and segregation, which is bad for everybody. So it is, again, the denial of the human being behind the migrant work that is exactly the problem. Mm -hmm. you, and, yeah. yeah. Yeah, you, you've been, um, last week you were in Lisbon. Um, your book is about to be published in six new languages on top of the six that I think it's already been published in. Um, so you might be visiting Greece, you might be visiting Turkey in the near future. In the past couple of months when you've been doing all your promotion, promotional trips, have your conversations with people about your book made you more hopeful that we can bring the humanness back into this debate, the humanity. And at the same time, also the evidence base. Yeah, I think there, there is reason for optimism, uh, partly because how people react across the political sort of spectrum. Because um, I, I, it's not a political manifest, on the contrary, I try to question a lot of things politicians say on, from the very left to the, the, the far right. But also opinion research actually gives reason for optimism. It is a, not a myth that the public has turned against immigration. The reality is that most people have very mixed feelings about migration. They understand that migrants do useful work. They may be worried about things they see on television. They may be worried about segregation, inequality. And it is totally understandable. Extremism is not as big as we think. Political problem we have, the real migration crisis is a political crisis. Because the voice of the extreme right wing is increasingly dominating and colonizing mainstream politi politics. 
So what we see is that mainstream parties are progressively adopting lots of narratives that the extreme right would only peddle in the past. And there's a big group of moderate voters that is not so happy with this. The problem is, is that mainstream politicians have become so afraid of the topic in Dutch, I, I talk about the migration phantom. It really works well in Dutch. Mm -hmm. It's like this issue nobody wants to touch. But I think the time is really there for mainstream politicians to, to, to dare to talk in a different way about immigration. Yeah. That acknowledges that migration comes with its problems, mm. its good sides, but not something we can think or wish away in the first place. And then come with real solutions. Yeah. I think that could actually resonate with voters. Just a good news story doesn't resonate. But what we now hear is scaremongering is clearly, and many people feel that, I think, feel uncomfortable with this. But the problem is there's no alternative narrative. We've seen it more often in politics. That paradigm shifts don't happen gradually. They tend to happen overnight. So I just hope that this book contributes a little bit to that. Of course, you need a much broader coalition, but I do believe it really has to change. This is no longer acceptable and no longer bearable, what we yeah. hear from politicians, most of them at least. I think that's a perfect, perfect way to round up the interview. Um, I think your book does a lot for the project you've just outlined for us, and I think all of us, by reading it, can contribute our own little grain of sand as well. Thank you so much for joining us, Professor De Haas. Um, for the audience, if you can't get enough of our interviews, then you can join us again on the 13th of May for our Lustrum interview with Minister of Defense Kaisa Ollongrens, and on the 14th of May for our interview with Herr Jan Segers, the former leader of the Christian Union. And we will also be interviewing Bernd Reichardt, the CEO of Super League, after the break. Um, so make sure that you follow us on social media and also take a look at our websites to not miss any upcoming interviews.